it's time to start, I guess. So there were seven epidemics of pandemics, actually, of cholera. Pandemics are worldwide. And uh, a couple of things I want to say about the 19th century uh, before I uh, embark on this. It, it was the two, two greatest achievements, in my opinion, were antisepsis and uh, the uh, uh, development of public health measures. Those two things saved more lives than anything else that was accomplished in the 19th century that I can think of. Maybe someone else can argue with me on that. Um, but uh, uh, I'm going to lead through that, and then that'll be at the threshold of actual antibiotics that we'll discuss in another talk. So at any rate, uh, one of the things about the um, uh, world adventure for the soldiers, uh, young men with, uh, as it was, uh, was that weren't females in the military uh, to speak of in those days that were traveling abroad. And uh, the British Empire kept a huge army of international people. And uh, soldiers moving from place to place uh, acquire illnesses and uh, spread them. They actually act as vectors. And um, cholera was no uh, exception. In um, India, uh, the uh, first pandemic of cholera broke out. And again, this is a day and age when nobody knew what was causing this. No one had any clue. It's just, it would hit and um, people would start dying. Um, but uh, they had uh, most certainly massive uh, mortality in India, but uh, it spread. Uh, they had 10,000 deaths among British troops and hundreds of thousands at least across India. But um, 100,000 uh, died in Java alone. Uh, but it burns itself out. Um, well, that's uh, it's uh, as I think it's called marismus. This added this uh, this idea that bad air caused disease uh, was um, prevalent in those days. But uh, uh, a bad pathogen will kill its host. A, a, a um, more symbiotic and uh, better adapted pathogen. Uh, uses its host like an Uber and uh, or like a restaurant and uh, doesn't kill it, just feasts on it and travels with it. And uh, so cholera wasn't a very good host, uh, wasn't a very good pathogen. Uh, people died of it too readily and too quickly. Uh, so as pandemics, terrible as they are, uh, uh, tended to last only so long. And uh, um, second epidemic came pretty soon after that, 1829, and lasted for 20 years, really. Started in India again uh, and went into Russia, Finland, and Poland. Um, in England, in 1831, 22,000 people. This was a huge mortality. And uh, there were other things like potato famine. and things. Malnutrition never helps if you've got a pandemic. Um, but uh, uh, I've got some other details there about it. But what are the really interesting things that came out of this time? There was a, an Irish uh, physician from Limerick who was a world traveler in a way. Uh, he ended up in India, involved in uh, telegraphs and trying to make a telegraph uh, company run a line from to uh, Europe, and uh, even did some innovative, um, inventive stuff there. But he studied chemistry, and he looked at what was happening with um, 
uh, cholera and people with cholera. One of the things these doctors, if you've ever seen Poldark or read Poldark, it, uh, the early 19th century and uh, before physicians, they did bloodletting, application of leeches, and uh, cathartic semitics. Medics make you throw up uh, and uh, toxins and they got pretty poor results. And uh, this fellow, O'Shaughnessy, had an idea which was uh, pretty insightful of uh, re restore blood to natural specific gravity. And his idea was to try to make saline solution and with minerals and bicarbonate and such and inject it. And he uh, wrote and promoted this and a physician, um, Thomas Lada, um, in Britain, um, accompanied by two other physicians uh, during the cholera epidemic actually tried this. Uh, I've talked to people that are a bit older than I who remembered making their own IV solutions when they were in residency and hospitals in the United States. Um, a lot of um, a lot of aspects that almost trace back to the 19th century were s still used by uh, in medical training paid into uh, later 20th century uh, in the United States at least. Uh, but at any rate, uh, they com they uh, formulated a um, a solution. They used, I guess, clean water and salts, probably not sterile water, which is a concern, but uh, that may be tolerable, They, depending on how clean the water was or if they boiled it or at least filtered it. And um, they probably had a hypotonic solution. If, if you have a hypotonic solution, meaning the, uh, the um, uh, Molecules per unit volume are less than what extracellular fluid in the plasma is, then the red blood cells will take in fluid until they lyse or break open. So you can get a hemolytic uh, effect. But at any rate, they had this extraordinary story they told and, and reported and uh, uh, where they had this this one female patient and she was at death's door. They called this the gray plague because they looked grayish uh, in color as opposed to like the black plague or the bubonic or pneumonic plague. But at any rate, which are the same but different forms of the uh, Yersinia uh, that was in the, uh, went across Europe uh, earlier on. Um, starting, I think, in uh, uh, October of 1347 was when a ship docked in Messina, Italy, and uh, was carrying uh, uh, probably rats that had fleas that had Yersinia um, uh, that's associated with the Black Plague that had come from the Black Sea. And... Um, in five years, about a quarter of the population of Europe was um, dead from that. Uh, there's a lot of risk in starting to cross ge geographical lines and uh, be exposed or expose others. But at any rate, they had this patient. She was at death's door and just um, uh, about to die, uh, basically comatose. And they... Um, had some kind of a needle that they'd a uh, hollow needle of some uh, so they could administer these uh, uh, fluids and they injected her and they injected her again and several times um, which was bold but I guess this is um, um, a desperate measure and by God she woke up and started talking to him and she said she felt a bit tired <laughs> And they reported this, and uh, there was outrage in the medical community across Europe that they would be uh, so um, uh, 
is it um uh uh a potato, uh, 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 you know, uh, violating the precious bodily fluids, in, invasively injecting fluids into the s sacred temple of the human body, and all these kinds of thinking uh, points. And so that was it. Nobody else really used saline uh, to speak of until around 1902, when physiology had come to be much better understood, and it was uh, also after the germ theory had really uh, 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 gotten developed. But uh, that, uh, so I think 1931, uh, 1831, uh, I believe was 1832, was the first attempt to give um, IV saline. So anyway, there was the uh, next cholera epidemic. It was really deadly and um, uh, really hurt Great Britain. And uh, 23,000 people died there. And uh, the reason I'm pointing it out in particular is because it um, uh, uh, sparked John Snow, who was a physician, to systematically study the um, distribution of cases, and then he started trying to figure out the source of this uh, malady, and looked at the water they were drinking. Um, and again, this was when people are thinking that's what they is from the fumes that they smell, and for one thing, the Thames and the city of London had about two million people, and so it had a you don't get this by watching these uh, costume dramas from the Victorian age or uh, Jane Eyre or something like this, but um, the, the uh, odiferous quality of dense populations prior to good hygiene and public health must have been um, pretty horrific. Uh, at any rate, he figured out that uh, there uh, was a home a whole cluster of uh, cases near this one water source, and he got them to take off the pump handle, and uh, the, the cases dropped. New, new cases uh, dropped. And uh, um, let's see. Yeah, there we go. During this uh, same uh, epidemic uh, in Florence, uh, there was a um, an academician who was... Uh, um, Animus and uh, a sectionist, as is, was uh, like a pathologist uh, uh, in skills. He was also good at microscopy, um, but he actually did necroscopies uh, 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 or like autopsies on people that had just succumbed to cholera. And he, um, this is really a feat. If you ever look at slides and look at all the variety of things you might see in a mixed source, um, he identified these little comma-shaped organisms, um, which uh, were um, the source of the disease. It's, uh, he called it Vibrio. And I'll show you some more of those in a moment. He published a paper on it in 1854. But he was in Florence, which was not the center of uh, medical uh, innovation, and um, he was ignored until 1865, 82 years after he had died. The uh, International Nomenclature Committee uh, adopted the title Vibrio Cholera Pacini as the correct name for the cholera causing organism. So uh, in um, Let's see, I've got this on my notes. 18, uh, Robert Koch, Robert Koch, um, somewhere here I have um, the year. Oh, here we are. Um, uh, 1883, Koch went on an expedition. He was a German pathologist and one of the, the big three in terms of the development of modern bacteriology. Uh, he went to Egypt with a um, group of scientists and the uh, 
uh, cholera epidemic at that time burned out and then he went to Persia and then on to India and he uh, was able to identify the same organism and publish it and so for a long time uh, uh, Robert Koch was given credit for having discovered the cholera of uh, axillus uh, and oh shoot I moved myself rather than the screen. Excuse me a second. Um, I've got to line up my screen so I can see what I'm doing. Um, okay, here's a slide. This is uh, Creative Commons, um, so uh, I didn't steal it. And uh, that's what the cholera... Uh, bacteria look like and they have little flagella or motile um, appendages that use energy to drive it on their exterior uh, what back so to speak of the uh, color of bacillus but bacillus meaning they're sort of rod shaped but curved and uh, so um, at any rate this is again this uh, another example how so many things are discovered in so many places uh, by so many different people, and um, it's often a toss up who gets the credit. Um, and overall, maybe it doesn't matter because uh, it matters that a lot of people are trying, and there's a culture that will promote. Uh, uh, spirit of discovery uh, and it's being carried out by men and women but uh, exactly who gets their name on a, a postage stamp doesn't matter in, in the big picture really um, maybe people in the ancestry.com would like to know that or something but who, who cares otherwise um, it's a facultative organ, anaerobe, um, uh, anaerobic uh, versus aerobic. Aerobic bacteria require the presence of oxygen and die without it. Anaerobes can survive without oxygen. The original bacteria on Earth were anaerobes. And uh, uh, if it's facultative, like often E. coli is facultative, meaning it can tolerate oxygen, but maybe prefers to be in a, a low oxygen atmosphere. Um, uh, that's the one characteristic about it. And pili uh, are these little like bumps on it with, uh, uh, they're covered with molecules that help them adhere to uh, their target, uh, whatever it is that uh, they use to gain the environment that lets them proliferate. Um, the reason they cause disease is because of a toxin, cholerogen, uh, which is heat labile, meaning if you, you know, had water from uh, a stream where as uh, a pandemic of cholera, you boil it, you'll be probably okay. This is a scanning electron microscope, uh, microscopic picture of it. Uh, the uh, It's one other person, I don't have a slide on him, but I want to mention one other person. There are three people that are associated with modern bacteria, uh, bacteriology or microbiology, and that's Louis Pasteur. Everyone really knows Robert Koch, uh, Robert Koch, who fewer people know of, and, uh, but he's still well known among uh, um, uh, uh, anybody that's ever studied pathology and uh, microbiology. And then the one that is pretty much overlooked, the name Ferdinand Julius Kohn, C-O-H-N. He was uh, from Germany, Breslau, and uh, he's one of the founders of modern bacteriology, microbiology, because he developed nosologic. Remember in one of my earlier talks, if you heard it, nosologic, Nosologic uh, work is um, doing medical classifications. That's actually a big part of what uh, is required. You've got to sort out what you got, and so you know what you're talking about. 
and have agreed on standards as to identification. So he uh, classified bacteria into four groups based on shape as spher spheroids or sphericals, short rods, threads, and spirals. And in, in a sense, those are still in use today. A spiral would be like the spirochete that was on my opening slide, which uh, uh, the syphilis is a spirochete like that, a treponema that has a kind of a central rod and it spirals around it. Uh, and um, so uh, he also, uh, sh well, I don't get too much into uh, details that are not so uh, pertinent to this, but uh, uh, he studied uh, transformation of certain, uh, uh, Vic, that's a good question. Vibrio, uh, one would think uh, that is likely that the, the flagella certainly move. I, um, I'm not sure that you could see the flagella easily with a light microscope unless you used oil immersion. Um, and it would be a bad specimen if you have to use oil immersion. Um, use oil immersion, you can get up to 1200 or so magnification without starting to get uh, um, prism effects or fraction problems. Uh, but um, maybe because they were moving around in fluid. Yeah, that would make sense. I don't know specifically how he chose that term. But at any rate, I'd like you to remember, it's like uh, these were the three pioneers, uh, Pasteur, Koch, Kahn. Uh, Kahn uh, was Jewish, and uh, they didn't allow him to take his exams in Breslau. He had to go to Berlin to his degree. And uh, his father had bought him a really high quality microscope, university or better quality. He used that his whole life, uh, a lot of discoveries. So uh, he also established the use of sterile culture mediums, which is something else I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. At any rate, this, this map here shows um, sort of a, way, a, a technique that uh, John Snow used to sort out the distribution of cholera. Uh, so they began to realize now oh, the drinking water might be a problem. Not everybody believed any of these discoveries. There were all of these people that are doubters. And uh, are just uh, unable to um, drop the things they had been taught when they were young. And this is reminiscent of, well, the whole idea of marismus went back to Galen, who was a, a 200 or so uh, common era, uh, was, a, a, was Roman. Uh, he died in Rome anyway, west of Turkey. Uh, it was part of the Roman Empire. But physicians in the 19th century, they were educated and proud of it and citing Galen and as though that was uh, the scripture and not able to think clearly. One other man that I thought was kind of interesting, I just wanted to mention him, is William Farr, um, who was an, a British epidemiologist, a physician as well, a founder of medical statistics. And he developed a nosolo nosology, I think I mentioned the word nos nosologic. I think that's a great word uh, if you're thinking about things medical. Um, there's a thing called the International Classification of Diseases and coding based on that, and that dates back to him. Um, oftentimes, physicians are uh, more uh, linguistic than mathematical. Uh, uh, I think I was um, more of an anomaly. Uh, so I prefer mathematical spatial thinking over... Uh, my language usage came to me more slowly than uh, mathematics did. But uh, at any rate, uh, he was uh, quite a bright guy and worth remembering. Now, there's a big thing that happened, which is a fascinating story. 
Uh, this is a from Punch uh, 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 magazine. It's a cartoon. It's public domain because it's from 1858. Uh, and uh, if they don't like it, so sue me, right? Uh, at any rate, uh, the Silent Highwaymen, they called this, uh, the Thames, uh, the Great Stink. The whole two million population of London and the vicinity were using the Thames as a sewer, an open sewer. And um, it, uh, Miasma, I guess I was calling marasma. Uh, marasma is something different. Miasma is the term for this foul air causing disease. They had uh, had to shut down Parliament at one time. Parliament was right on the Thames, and they had uh, young men waving fans by the window to try to keep the fumes out. And uh, um, I think they had a hot summer which didn't help. And um, so at any rate, um, the fact that um, everybody's um, excrement was going in there drinking water didn't help. They were bothered by the smell, but they didn't know that the uh, problem was uh, germs. Uh, they, they used lime just like they would use on bodies. Um, they try to take the stench of a, of a decomposing body away. Um, and that didn't help. So they passed a bill on the 2nd of August, 1858. Pasteur, as I understand, lost three daughters in childhood to typhoid salmonella, food poisoning, uh, so it can be invasive and cause liver abscesses and all kinds of things. So this kind of public health uh, progress Change the world. It, 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 uh, human beings take this for granted these days, but it, it was one of the massive accomplishments of the 19th century to have building projects like this, have cooperation, and uh, focus construction product uh, projects and. Also, the scientific work to back it up. It was like 1862 when uh, Pasteur published on uh, the germ theory of disease, and um, basically that's of in microbio or in biology. It's of um, importance uh, comparable to uh, the atomic theory that all part all all substances are composed of tiny particles that are atoms or atoms combined in bonds that make molecules. Um, and um, people didn't believe that even up to the time of Boltzmann. Uh, Boltz, uh, Boltzmann uh, committed suicide thinking all was lost because he had based his entire uh, 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 beliefs uh, in physics and his entire career on, on the atomic theory of matter and developing statistics, uh, statistical mechanics. So at any rate, the germ theory is a big deal, but um, it was not until the late 1890s. So like 35 years before physicians in North America really believed it. They, ex they rejected it saying this, it sounded like science fiction or just made up, they didn't, believe that these little specks could cause disease and they just thought it was nonsense. Um, and to that I have to ask, what is it about North America that makes them so they just choose to be behind on science? Um, anyway. <laughs> um, like climate change. So it was a fifth epidemic. Uh, it, it was terrible for uh, Asia, Africa, South America. Uh, France and Germany had uh, got hit, like I mentioned earlier, Hamburg, um, and Russia got hit hard. Uh, and uh, the development in Russia was not as far along as it was in Western Europe. And uh, 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 Japan also got hit hard. Um, but the quarantine measures of John Snow 
really had made a difference. Um, and a vaccine was developed for cholera in 1892. Um, so, as to mention uh, Koch, um, I think uh, in later talks I have, uh, uh, or for later talks, I'll have a picture of Pasteur for some of the things he did, but uh, 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 Koch was um, credited with, um, oh, let me see here, um, anthrax, though, um, uh, and cholera and tuberculosis in terms of discovery. And he actually uh, promoted the germ theory of the disease and his Koch postulates that the germs always have to be found. It's, it's very intuitive if you have the idea of germs causing disease, that if you have a, an identifiable disease to attribute it to a specific bacteria as a causative agent, you have to be able to demonstrate their presence all the time. And um, that you can culture it. Now, culturing, that's, that's another whole big step that I want to talk about for a minute. Uh, but uh, um, just, it, and it's another aspect of how, if you think of it, the uh, development of culturing bacteria relates to agriculture and then food science and preservation of food. And uh, 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 at any rate, uh, after you've isolated the bac uh, bacteria you think is accountable, you have to be able to culture it. And then if you introduce it into an organism, actually an animal that's susceptible, you would induce the disease. And for something like anthrax, this was easier. Um, I guess uh, uh, 1870 was when he uh, discovered uh, the uh, um, uh, anthrax as uh, uh, a uh, cause of, uh, of, uh, of these. Basically, it's a, it has an exotoxin that's a, a complex exotoxin, which is various combinations of like three protein units, and uh, it kills cells. It can start, it's a horrible disease. I may recall some years ago, uh, people were mailing powder to people that had um, uh, weaponized anthrax. In that case, uh, anthrax is sporulating. It forms spores. And if you inhale it, the spores are tiny. They first go to high uh, in your lungs. They don't make the lungs uh, infect. They drain to, they're, they're picked up by macrophages, these spores, and carried to lymph nodes in the middle of the chest called the mediastinum. And there the uh, spores um, convert and because um, they're in a nice little susceptible area and start to take over and cause mediastinitis. And um, then that's pretty, that's pretty sick. It, mediastinitis, uh, that used to have a very, very high mortality. Uh, from there, it would then uh, infect the lungs and kind of reverse. Oftentimes you have something in the lungs that causes mediastinitis, but there it goes from um, spores getting by your friendly macrophages, which are inflammatory cells that eat up corn um, invaders, and uh, they take them behind the walls of Troy, and uh, there they crawl out of their horse and uh, spore and start to do destruction, and then they just go to the lungs. Once it, you get into the lungs, uh, uh, pneumonitis, um, for, uh, a second phase of this kind of um, pulmonary anthrax, the mortality is about 85%. Most of the time, anthrax is on the skin. And hunters and people that handle animals um, would get it, and um, sometimes it would clear up and sometimes it wouldn't. It, it had uh, oh, 30 to 50% mortality, I think. Uh, it was originally called wool sorters disease for 
laborers who would work with wool cut from sheep. Sheep may have anthrax. I come from old people who came from old people. And my father told me once about, I remember, um, and I, I once had a uh, brush uh, and a cup and soap in the bottom, and I could uh, soap up the end of the brush and then put the soap on my uh, face and, for shaving. And uh, my father told me about, um, they used to make these uh, brushes out of bristles of uh, uh, livestock and like cattle or horses. And uh, uh, if they had anthrax, there were times, there were cases where people use those brushes on their face and they get a little nick and they'd get anthrax on their face uh, from the brush. So cutaneous and pulmonary anthrax and uh, intestinal anthrax is another major uh, presentation where um, that's one way cattle get it. Uh, Yes, anthrax is a terrible danger. Um, it, it's used in terrorism and um, as a bioweapon. Uh, but cattle um, eating grass, it can be, they could be eating where some cattle had anthrax and were buried years before. And Pasteur showed that, uh, um, yes, uh, especially if uh, the, those spores last for years and earthworms can ingest them and carry them to the surface and excrete them. And the, the anthrax spores get taken up by the grass. And so cattle eating the grass ingest the spores. So uh, disposal of animals that have anthrax is, is uh, pretty uh, tricky. If you bury them, it has to be really deep. Uh, and the fourth way you can get it is by injection. Of course, uh, uh, Pasteur uh, developed an, uh, um, a, uh, uh, a vaccine for anthrax, and then he injected, he had a, a sheep that had been vaccinated, and uh, he had a sheep that had anthrax, and he took blood from the anthrax, sheep and injected the ones with the vaccine and they didn't get sick. It's the ones that were naive or unvaccinated, un, um, uh, their immune system had no previous knowledge of anthrax and they would get sick and die. So um, at any rate, uh, again, a, a lot of the uh, what is considered medical advances done for the sake of agriculture uh, and food production. Uh, I just think they're really tied together. That's one of the themes I just wanted to make in this talk. So I should go. I look like I'm doing OK in time. So there was yet another uh, cholera epidemic uh, at the end of the century, uh, which again, went into Russia and parts of Europe, uh, Northern Africa and Middle East. Um, by 1923, it was uh, uh, pretty much uh, limited just to outbreaks in India until around 1961. And there's been kind of a continued slow burn of cholera since then. Uh, and um, they can tell what strain it is and this sort of thing. They have vaccinations. I was in uh, Spain and uh, there was an outbreak uh, some years ago and I had I didn't have my card. Um, so they, um, seems to me I told this last week, they um, had an air gun. I, I went, I had to leave Spain. I had to be able to show I had uh, been vaccinated for an or um, uh, cholera. And so uh, they basically shot uh, the uh, 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 dosage through my skin. And uh, uh, I don't think I even got a Band-Aid. I wasn't too worried about it. But uh, um, 
Yeah, I did. I did tell this before. I think because I also told about how they in World War One they would use the same needle going down row to vaccinate um, roots in the United States as uh, they're you know, if you they're gone now basically those soldiers. But uh, if you talk to them, they'd say, "Man, you didn't want to be the last in the line because the needle was really dull." So you'd really have to jab it to get it through the skin. And uh, I was sort of stunned by hearing that. But um, at any rate, um, in, no, it's, uh, well, it it's North America. And, you know, it was, uh, uh, Abe Flexner was um, a man who went uh, and studied European training of uh, doctors. and. It, uh, came back and uh, basically in the United States, for the most part, doctors were trained by apprenticeships. And um, he proposed that they have um, basic science training and then uh, in, in anatomy and uh, bio, biochemistry or chemistry and uh, organic chemistry. And, and I'm not sure when biochemistry became self-aware and started calling self biochemistry, but um, um, embryology and basic biology that's pertinent to, me to medicine, followed by a, a year preclinical pathology and um, how diseases are caused and effects on physiology and uh, how to diagnose them and then have clinical training in hospitals, training hospitals. And because of his work, it was 1916 when I'm sort of going on reading from years ago, but 1916 was when the average patient in the United States could go to the average doctor and have a better than 50 50 chance of walking out better than when they went in. So um, there was, uh, there's been a lot of uh, range. Yeah, flip a coin. Well, it's better than that these days, I think. Uh, but uh, um, it's taken a lot to do that. Uh, so um, there was this uh, um, uh, earthquake in Haiti uh, uh, a few years ago. And um, Nepalese uh, volunteers uh, apparently contaminated the water uh by their excrement they carried cholera and uh because you can acquire immunity if you survive it and you can survive it if you get fluids um uh basically um you die of um hypovolemia or loss of body fluids and shock and your kidneys shut down you have adequate blood flow to your kidneys and they just die and you die of renal failure and dehydration and heart gives out and uh, coma and it goes pretty quickly um, but uh, uh, at any rate uh, they were able to look at the strain of cholera and it matched with what would have come from N Nepal um, and they're still struggling with uh, cholera there in Haiti they didn't have that before they had plenty of other problems uh, so let's see so we're still struggling with cholera in different places. Uh, it's recently in 1994, um, um, uh, there was a refugee camp with about a million Rwandans and uh, 12,000 died of uh, um, drug resistant Vibrio cholera strain, strains. Um, so, uh, universal public health is really what's needed uh, where safe drinking water and uh, proper disposal of human excrement as that's a fact of life uh, will do more to protect uh, infant mortality and things like that And so it's considered that there's this basically ongoing smoldering uh, seventh cholera epidemic. 
And somebody mentioned Graham as a uh, leader in uh, uh, bacteriology, but uh, um, I don't think he's at that level. Uh, but he did make a pretty outstanding uh, contribution. And this reflects the emergence of organic uh, dyes that were, uh, I think it was 18. 1852, uh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name who, uh, the first organic dye on uh, East London, he had a little uh, laboratory in his apartment, um, um, blocking on his name at the moment, but at any rate, using organic dyes, you could uh, had tissues that were thinly cut or a smear of germs or material that you wanted to see what was in it and look for germs, you could put that dye on it. Trouble is the dye would soak on everything. Uh, so uh, Graham developed uh, this technique and it resulted in a dichotomy that uh, applies to most bacteria, uh, Gram positive or Gram negative. Um, the gram-positive bacteria, the ones that were really susceptible to penicillins, they have this uh, peptidoglycan uh, um, cell wall that's in the top there in red, and um, then there's a tiny space, and uh, then there's cell membrane inside. And uh, Perkin, yes, thank you, William Perkin. And... Uh, the gram-negative has a really uh, sparse peptidoglycan uh, layer, and it has an uh, external mem uh, outer membrane, which is lipopolysaccharide. Um, and um, uh, it uh, does not take up the purple stain that's used in the gram staining so readily. Uh, let me tell you the technique, uh, just in a, uh, in a nutshell. Uh, it's not hard. I've done these before, and it's really pretty cool. Uh, I've got a bunch of microscopes. I've thought about setting it up so I could do gram stains, and I uh, haven't done it, but uh, uh, I should. At any rate, you have crystal violet. You, you take a smear, and you need to do something so it doesn't just wash off. So usually you just quick heat it. Uh, and so it applies. You can also put uh, some alcohol in it, let it dry, ethanol. But uh, I've always just heated it. Uh, you don't heat it till it's uh, that hot, just to warm it up. Oh, you can do that over a flame. And then you apply the crystal violet. The trouble is that it won't, uh, won't adhere to uh, uh, the acids, like nucleic acids, uh, that it likes to adhere to in peptidoglycan cell walls, unless you have a mordant, uh, something to make it stick. So you apply a drop of uh, iodide solution, and uh, that traps the crystal violet uh, um, in a combination with uh, target molecules. Um, and then you dip it in ethanol, and then you counter stain with a red stain like uh, uh, saffronin or uh, basic fuchsin stains uh, are regarded as better for gram negatives. Um, and it does make it incredibly easier to see what you're dealing with. And if you uh, see bacteria and you are describing their morphology or their shape, spherical or spiral or axilla or whatever, um, and um, you can stain them uh, uh, with uh, gram stain. Uh, there are a lot of other stains these days as well. Uh, you can uh, further uh, classify them, gram positive, gram negative. Um, makes a big difference. Uh, for instance, like strep or staph uh, would be gram positive. Antisepsis, I'd mentioned, is a big deal for the 19th century. And uh, Joseph Lister uh, used carbolic acid, which is actually phenol. Phenol is most easily 
gotten as like benzene from petroleum and then you can uh, sulfonate it or uh, react it with a chloride at one of the carbons. Uh, benzene is a six carbon aromatic flat planar ring um, that resonates. And so it's pretty stable, but um, you replace the, you put, I think you put the uh, chlorobenzene with uh, uh, just one chlorine molecule with a lye um, um, or soda ash or something that's pretty strong and heat it. And then uh, you'll end up with uh, a phenol with an OH or hydroxyl group. That's what uh, that's what carbolic acid is, and uh, Louis Pasteur used carbolic acid, which is phenol, and uh, on um, anthrax to uh, uh, attenuate or, or kill the anthrax, so that he could use it to make a vaccine. Um, if phenol's pretty uh, reactive, if you ever touch it to your skin, you'll you'll get a burn. Uh, so. Uh, uh, there have been times I've used actual, actually high concentration phenol for certain things. Um, so uh, Lister was the first to really use antiseptic techniques and uh, he um, persisted and got attention for it and eventually became Queen Victoria's personal physician. Um, he uh, used uh, phenol uh, solution on uh, um, dressings on this uh, young patient who had a leg injury that often would end up in uh, amputation. At the turn of the century, eight, uh, 1800, the number one um, treatment for uh, a limb infection from trauma especially uh, was amputation. And often uh, 40 percent of the people that got amputations died. It was pretty rough, but that was the best they had. They didn't know what they were dealing with until 1862 when Pasteur and Kahn and uh, Robert Koch um, really promoted the germ theory of biology and um, medicine. So uh, at any rate, uh, all this led to eventually having areas and hospitals that are considered germ-free that get disinfected after every patient is, uh, has left for whatever they're in an operating room. And uh, so it's brought down surgical infections in, enormously along with some other things. Um, I wanted to point out one other thing uh, it, um, about antisepsis, if you're out in the frontier or the wilderness and you've got an infection, if you've got wine or vinegar, you can use that uh, to uh, help your dressings not get infected. You don't have sterile stuff to work with. Um, I had some notes here. Oh, Hippocrates mixed wine and vinegar in dressings of wounds around 400 um, um, CE. Um, and I suppose uh, somebody figured it was a salad. Uh, well, wine and vinegar, I would not have the oil. It was a lame joke, I'm sorry. Wine was used in dressings in uh, 14th century Italy. Um, the Sir John Pringle coined the word antisepsis in an article he wrote in 1750 on experiments upon septic and antiseptic substances. And um, uh, later, mercury, 1766, mercury was in, used as an antiseptic. And uh, I think in Beethoven's apartment, uh, there was mercury or probably uh, syphilitic uh, lesions he was dealing with. 1811 was when iodide was, or iodine was first used on treating wounds. And it's not something you should take internally. It's pretty toxic. But 
I think it's uh, uh, 53 atomic weight, atomic number 53, and it's pretty heavy. So if it is given internally in any form, it'll show up in the bladder. And when they started doing x-rays, they saw uh, radio contrast effects in the bladder from they associate with iodide and uh, or iodine, and so iodide in contrast agents arose from that. Um, in addition, this um, first surgery there uh, with an anesthetic was done in 1846, 1888, uh, 1884. This um, advance on the steam digester papen autoclave was invented, and it was used not only for sterilization, but also for vulcanization of rubber. And um, Olstead was the first to use uh, rubber surgical gloves in the United St States. And there's a couple of others uh, there. It, it was actually around 1962 that the first latex gloves uh, that were treated with gamma radiation uh, were used in surgery. And um, they were powdered and powder can cause allergic reactions and fibrosis and uh, severe inflammatory response. And I was always bothered by the powder when I did surgery. So I, uh, I thought it was nuts, uh, I suppose, but I always had them bring a basin. Uh, it seemed like it bothered my hands too, uh, but uh, it would make my hands break down. Uh, but um, uh, they were powdered on the outside as well. So I would wash my uh, gloved hands after I'd gowned for surgery and uh, in a basin of water, a, a sterile st steel ba basin, uh, sterile water, um, just to get the powder off. And in 2016, I think, all powdered uh, gloves were banned in the United States by the FDA. There was um, let's see, one other, oh, 1795, uh, there was a treatise on uh, the endemic corporal fever of Aberdeen, way up north in Scotland. Um, uh, um, there were all these women having corporal fever, and um, Alexander Gordon started requiring everyone in that hospital to wash their hands. Uh, later, in around 42, I think, or Semmelweis in, uh, Vienna, who was Hungarian, but he was working in Vienna, um, noticed that the uh, midwives uh, had less uh, post um, delivery fevers in the women and less maternal death than the doctors did. And they sensed that at the suggestion that they were spreading this uh, infection and causing harm. But uh, that was uh, um, uh, a historic point. It uh, is often pointed to the improvement of uh, sterility in hospitals. Also in 1883, um, uh, Gustave Neuve of Kiel was the first to use a sterilized uh, surgical gown. So. Basically, in the last part of the uh, 19th century, more and more steps were taken to prevent um, the uh, participants in surgery, whether it were nurses or uh, technicians or uh, anybody giving anesthesia or whatever, from being vectors in disease. And you're right, it's a lot of people suffered terribly in the Civil War. Um, deaths due to that, and deaths due to uh, drinking bad water. Um, I want to tell one last story, if I may. Just over. Do I have time for one last story? Okay, thank you. Um, and um, uh, there was a, a search for something to grow bacteria on just to be able to culture bacteria was a was a challenge and required the input of a lot of people uh, Pasteur used a broth and uh, made from meat or vegetable matter I'm sorry I, 
bumped my microphone. And uh, uh, Robert Koch wanted a solid uh, culture medium. And he actually tried to use slices of potato. Um, I bet that smelled rich uh, after a day or so uh, when he would inoculate it with bacteria. But uh, in 1882, after not being able to use gelatin, uh, uh, you know, because it would be liquid at, uh, you want to uh, culture 35 to 37 degrees centigrade or so, similar to body temperature. Uh, and uh, gelatin tends to liquefy and also it gets digested by bacteria. So instead of having a solid matrix where you can see bacteria growing in colonies, which is what they would wanted to, uh, um, well, eggs are also kind of liquefy unless uh, you heated them and cooked them and then they're uh, coagulated. Um, eggs, uh, uh, embryos, as embryos are used for cultivating viruses, but at any rate, in 1882, uh, there was uh, a brilliant uh, suggestion by the Frau of Walter Hesse, who was an assistant in Robert Koch's laboratory, and her name was Fanny Hesse. And she suggested that they use agar. Agar comes from red algae, and uh, it's uh, basically got no, pro no protein, no fat, no uh, uh, sugar. It's very fibrous, and it's powdered, and uh, it's a complex algae, like seaweed. And um, it had been used in making desserts uh, and Asian dishes for a long time. And uh, it's a vegetarian alternative to gelatin if you don't like eating hooves of horses and cattle uh, from broken down cartilage. Um, but uh, uh, at any rate, um, it's not hard to make uh, a culture medium. You get, uh, it's about uh, 5.2 uh, gram percent, uh, meaning 5.2 grams of uh, powdered agar um, that's uh, sterile. And um, you measure that out and put it in with uh, uh, oh, a total of 100 milliliters of ionized, deionized water. And uh, at room temperature and you can do it in steps and mix more water in till you get the uh, uh, you need to get the powder to mix in with the water. Now, if you took agar and just ate it straight, uh, solid, uh, it probably would obstruct your GI tract, in the, even in the esophagus, because it swells over 20 times its size. It takes up 20 times its volume in water. So, uh, uh, it's sort of like peat, peat moss. Uh, but at any rate, so you make this this agar and uh, uh, mixed in with uh, 5.2 grams and 100 milliliters of deionized water and get it stirred up really well. Lid on it uh, or something and autoclave it. And um, uh, the, um, oh, I think it's like 120 degrees or so centigrade. And uh, for uh, up to 20 minutes or so. And then on the average Petri plate, uh, you can uh, put about 20 milliliters and then uh, let it solidify. And then you store the Petri plates upside down. Petri plate was invented in 1887 by Julius Petri, TRI. And um, basically, there are two. Uh, lids, one slightly larger than the other with glass, which was one of the great discoveries of mankind. And uh, uh, they, uh, they nest, but one over the other is a lid. And uh, and when you got a solidified agar in there, you store it upside down. Uh, so the moisture doesn't tend to collect on want the agar plate to be dry. If you wanted to culture something, you can make a little wire loop. Uh, take any wire and make a little little loop and then uh, heat it till it's red hot. Get, the, get a little black body radiation and then sample, get your sample just a little bit, 
thin it with a little water if you want and um, uh, um, basically before you get your sample after you've sterilized your loop you probably need to cool it down by waiting or else you can just touch it to the auger in one spot and uh, then um, uh, uh, you get your sample on your little loop and then you just uh, uh, scoot it over the surface like in a zigzag uh, of the auger and then you put your auger in a in an incubator um, at about the same temperature as my yogurt maker <laughs> and uh, 35 to 37 degrees centigrade and um, you'll see colonies of bacteria pure colonies grow if you diluted your sample properly and um, since around 1919 um, there, uh, there was a man uh, Edward Rosenau who combined uh, dextrose, dextrose broth and calf brain and um, this led to uh, a form of auger called uh, brain heart infusion auger um, BHI auger and it's particularly good. They used it for uh, um, cultivating um, streptococcus, but also for mycology. If you want to uh, culture uh, fungi, um, it's a good auger for that. And a lot of these organisms are very fastidious, and some can't be cultured at all. Um, the um, uh, syphilis, for instance, um, Nobody's been able to culture in a pure, uh, uh, short of a cell culture. Uh, and uh, that's basically it. Uh, I had one last quickie point I wanted to make, uh, uh, somebody I wanted to mention, uh, and that was Harvey Washington Wiley who you've never heard of, but he was a physician in, who was uh, in, a sort of a self-educated um, um, uh, chemist, and he ended up on the faculty at uh, Purdue University, which was a land-grant college started based on a, uh, a, a law signed in uh, by uh, Abraham Lincoln, and uh, he made it his... Uh, purpose in life to uh, have unadulterated food and uh, there were um, it's a long story but it would really be uh, something you might enjoy reading about uh, Harvey Washington Wiley W-I-L-E-Y um, his work led to the founding of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 which um, led to the FDA, the Federal Drug and uh, our, um, uh, uh, Food Administration. And after he had um, had that, he started working on purity of pharmaceuticals because there was a lot of problems with adulteration and uh, um, things not being what they're supposed to be. So uh, again, a lot of people of, of conscience and of uh, responsible intelligence uh, are to account for the fact that you live a life that's free of miseries that are avoidable. And millions of people really have contributed to all this body of technology and culture of being able to assess the microscopic world and understand how it's impacting us and how to keep it from hurting us. And uh, recently they've been attacking the FDA. They wanted to move it to Kansas City basically to get rid of uh, researchers because uh, they want to control the message and some of the researchers they feared were uh, concerned about uh, climate change, and the, the FDA is part of the uh, Department of Agriculture, you see. So, uh, well, that's it. I'll stop right there. And I've gone 13 minutes over, but uh, 
food for thought. <laughs> it's having mentioned, uh, let's see, I'll show you my last slide here, which is just uh, uh, kind of a statement of some of the big things I think that have come together for uh, all these uh, things that humans are able to do in the coordinated, uh, 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 educated fashion. And if uh, this is all that matters to you, there are jobs, jobs, jobs involved, involved in all these activities. <laughs> so thank you, Mike. Any questions? Thank you, Day. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Edgar. Thank you, Tata. Thank you, Cass. Thank you, Katja. Get a, get a dessert with uh, agar, uh, Cass. Thank you, Vic. I, I found it as I was reading and planning and what I would say. I just thought, I got to mention this, I got to mention that. And it's, uh, it was a fun topic for me. I hope it was fun for you. So perhaps uh, sometime next year I could uh, uh, talk. Oh, Simmelweis. Uh, well, he um, he got people washing their hands. Uh, there's a lot written about him. Uh, I, uh, I had a Hungarian uh, friend and colleague uh, in Philadelphia uh, who was just uh, so proud of him. Uh, but um, uh, basically the take home story from him was that uh, uh, washing hands between cases. The thing was they had uh, women that uh, if they got the streptococcus, which is an invasive gram positive coccus bacterium uh, uh, and can cause abscesses and um, um, purulence uh, and they would go from one delivery to the other and this was uh, the time you know and, and there was one article I read it was an anesthesia uh, history review um, but like 1850 the chances were not very high that you would go get a surgical procedure and have the doctors wearing anything but street clothes. And they were proud of it. They were proud that they could go in their fine clothing and take off a leg and uh, not muss up their clothing. And um, uh, must have been the same with uh, um, uh, deliveries and they would go from one delivery to another without washing their hands so they were direct vectors transferring this uh, um, pus forming or virulent uh, streptococcus uh, from uh, one patient to another and uh, postpartum the um, mother would get a streptococcal infection in the raw lining of the uterus and uh, get sepsis and die in many cases. So it was really kind of a horrible situation. Again, it's interesting that it, I think it was uh, 1795 uh, in Aberdeen that Alexander Gordon noted the same thing. But it takes a, quite a while for the even the educated public 
uh, target public that you want to get the message to to come across and buy it and to change their culture. That's about all I know to say about Simmelweis at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments or I got turned around in the talk, so my avatar was speaking uh, with my back with its back turned to you. My next talk, uh, I, I wanted to uh, continue in this, uh, but focus on uh, mycobacterial diseases like leprosy and tuberculosis and um, um, atypical mycobacteria like bovine tuberculosis and that sort of thing, and malaria and syphilis on those three um, matters. I could do that in one hour. Uh, well, Lyme's is a, uh, kind of interesting, and it's related to a um, uh, spirochete. Uh, that may deserve a talk of its own. I wash my hands quite a bit. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm not uncomfortable about living in a sea of germs. Uh, and one of the talks as I develop more information about antibiotics, I want to tell you about uh, René Dubois, uh, or uh, Dubois, I guess. Um, his family, uh, he was American, uh, born in France, but uh, his family actually pronounced uh, as Dubois, uh, which is a, a sort of atypical pronunciation. But he was... Um, kind of revised the germ theory to take us away from absolute fear and dread and loathing of germs to understanding that uh, live in a sea of germs and to get disease from them is more the exception. So, uh, and he played a role that was pretty significant in the development of uh, uh, antibiotics. Well, thank you for attending, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, and if you have to wash your hands a whole lot, I, I don't really recommend using these antiseptic soaps uh, that have uh, harsh chemicals. I think uh, getting some suds. Uh, the suds um, disrupts um, viral capsules and bacteria. And... Um, uh, you don't have to wash in real hot water either. At time, it removes the oils from your skin. You and uh, wash with cold water, and your hands will hold up better. Thank you, Shantao. Washing with pure water only um, while kind of rubbing your hands thoroughly and digging under your fingernails and letting it uh, wash under the fingernails is better than no, so uh, no soap or water at all. Um, a little bit of suds uh, 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 helps with uh, getting rid of pathogens especially if you're going to do food handling, uh, a brush to wash hands. I, you know, in surgery, you use a brush and you especially brush your nail beds, the fingernail beds, uh, and underneath the nails uh, is a uh, niche for a lot of bacteria. 